Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at TexasConflictCoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening or tweet us at TX Conflict Coach. Hello, this is Zena Zumeta, and I'm here with Tracy Culbreth, we are guest hosts for today. Our program is the Conflict Pivot, turning conflict into peace of mind. If you've been told not to take conflict personally, you only have half the story. Before you can do that, you have to take conflict more personally. In this program, Tammy Lenski, author of The Conflict Pivot, Turning Conflict into Peace of Mind, will discuss three simple practices you can do on your own, anytime and anywhere, to avoid the most common conflict resolution mistakes, understand why certain conflicts get their hooks into you, and figure out how to liberate yourself. Hello, I'm Tracy Colbreth, and joining us is Dr. Tammy Lenski. Dr. Tammy Linsky helps people excel at conflict resolution by mastering their reactions, problem-solving creatively, and forging lasting results. A mediator, coach, speaker, author, and conflict resolution teacher, she has helped thousands of organizations, individuals, and mediators worldwide resolve conflict masterfully. Tammy was a founding faculty member of the world's first master's degree, in mediation and has been featured in Bloomberg's Business Week and numerous other publications. A member of the Association for Conflict Resolution Academy of Advanced Practitioners, Tammy was recognized in 2012 with the Association's Mary Parker Follett Award for innovative and pioneering work in the conflict resolution field. Welcome to the program, Dr. Tammy Linsky. Hi, Zena. Hi, Tracy. I'm really glad to be here with you today. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. We're so delighted to have you. And the first question we want to ask you is, uh, what led you to write the book? Yeah, I was thinking about that question, Zena, and the fact that there were a gazillion reasons that no one would really want to hear about here. So I've drilled it down to three. And um, Ah. so the first is um, that I wanted to simplify the conflict resolution process for people. And that's, you know, that's an incredibly tall order, and that's why it took so long to write the book. But um, I think that the, the reason I wanted to do that is highlighted uh, in, a, in a quick story from uh, involving a graduate student of mine several years ago. His name is Craig. And he, we were in class, and we were discussing a conflict resolution book um, that uh, is just a fabulous book. And he put it down, and he said, you know, this is a great book. But um, And I loved every second of it, but when I'm in the middle of a conflict myself, I cannot remember everything here. Could someone please just tell me the three things that if I do them, they'll make the most difference? And I remember sitting there and thinking, that's exactly right. All these great conflict resolution ah, books out there. Ex- right, exactly. You know this from the work that you do, that there are great books out there, but they try to walk yeah. us through everything. They try to give us everything that we might be able to do. And I thought, what are the three things that if we do them ourselves in our own lives, we'll get 80 to 90% of the way there? So that was the first reason. Second reason is that, um, and again, because of the, the work that the two of you do, like mine, we see this happen in our work. People really sort of hand their power over to the other person when, uh, we're, when they're stuck in conflict because they really rely on what the other person will do or won't do in order to get the conflict resolved. And that's a very, what we would call in, in sort of academic terms, an interactional way of resolving conflict, right? Focusing on the way people interact. Another way is to exactly. focus on interpersonal, the way that people relate and communicate in conflict. And all of these are, have incredible merit. They're really important. What I also know and what you both know is that there's an intrapersonal way to be thinking and working with conflict. The work we do ourselves on ourselves that actually can have a huge impact on 
freeing ourselves from the conflict and moving on with our lives. So I really wanted to do that, and that was the second reason. And the third reason is that I really wanted yeah. to – yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Zena. No, I just I just wanted to say that, that I thought you were masterful about both of those. Um, for giving just three approaches that are very memorable um, and then saying, you know, you can do it yourself. I think that's very, very helpful. So, yes, please continue. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. It makes a, it means a lot to me to hear you say that. Um, and the third reason is really brief. It's just that I saw uh, the same mistakes made again and again and again when I was mediating and coaching. And, and frankly, I made those mistakes in my own life sometimes in conflict. And uh, there were three that kept coming up again and again in work. And I thought, I can help people avoid those three common mistakes when they're stuck in conflict. And so the book was really intended to try to do that as well. So you mentioned the three common mistakes that people make um, when they're engaged in conflict, Tammy. Could you describe them a little bit more for the listening audience? I sure can. Thanks, Tracy. Um, The first is that we tend to focus, not exclusively maybe, but a lot on the other person's behavior. So we tie the outcome, whatever is going to happen, to what we can get them to do or not do, say or not say. Mm -hmm. And the problem, as I said earlier, is that that hands over our power because if they don't do what we want them to do, then we're stuck, right? I really want people not to be so stuck and to take a lot of that power back. So that's the first mistake is tying what you want to what the other person will or won't do and putting a huge amount of effort into trying to get them to do it anyway. Um, The second mistake is getting stuck on replaying the past again and again and again. And um, Zena, I'm sure you've seen this in your mediation work, that the past is a very alluring place to be, right? All the things that happened and what really right. happened and the truth of the matter. And uh, it's seductive because it's a very safe place. We feel very sure about what happened. And the future is a little un- more unknown, a little less safe. But I think of conflict as a trap of the past. And conflict resolution is really an act of the future. It's what's going to happen from here forward. And so I really wanted to help people not find a way to get out of that trap of the past, to figure out what to do about what happened or what their understanding is of what happened, figure out what they can do with that so they can move on. And then the third one is it's a really important theme in the book, and I talk a lot about it in the book, is this idea of people dwelling on their stuck story. I call it the stuck story. And uh, the best way to describe that is to think of a movie trailer. So you see uh, a a trailer for a movie on TV, or we saw lots of snippets of movies uh, in the recent Academy Awards, and um, a trailer is sort of a brief encapsulation of the high points of the movie. In fact, sometimes when we go into the movie after seeing the trailer, we think, well, I saw the whole movie in the trailer. There's really nothing more for me here. It's not as good as the trailer is. (laughs) And a stuck story is kind of like a person's movie trailer of their conflict. And we think of the story we tell ourselves about the conflict as the story of the conflict. It's more accurate to say it's our story of the conflict, and the other person has their story of the conflict. And part of the challenge we face is they don't always overlap particularly well. Um, And we practice these stories, right? We tell our pa- our partner or our spouse, we talk to our sister on the phone, we go into a colleague's office and we shut the door and we say, let me tell you. We go on our afternoon run and we replay it over and over in the shower. We're playing. <laughs> and the more we do that, we're polishing it so nicely. It starts from our brain's perspective to feel like the truth. Um, and I really know that to get past a conflict, to figure it out and be done with it once and for all, we need to lessen our grip on their stuck stories, on our stuck stories. And so um, the better thing to do is to figure out why we're so captivated by those movie trailer bits, what are the pieces that we keep dwelling on, and Uh and use our attention that way instead. That's great. Uh, I I also see a lot of times that people really do get stuck in their stories, especially when you're doing mediations. They keep retelling the same piece of their story over and over again, and sometimes they use the past as a crutch. Uh, So I found those common mistakes to be really relatable in the work that I see every day. Absolutely. You nailed it, Tracy. That's precisely right. And one of the things, you know, we're we're taught as mediators when we're we're initially trained is to um, sort of 
steer people away in from that past because there's not much we can do about it. We can't change it. We can't even trust that everyone's version is exactly right. So what are we going to do as mediators? We have to try to redirect them. But the challenge is there's a reason those things keep coming back up. And if we can figure out what that reason is and deal with that, then we don't have to tug them sort of into the future. We can They'll pivot on their own. And so that's one of the things that I find most useful about this book when I'm in the mediator's chair is is finding ways to work with folks that way. Thank you, Sammy. And, I, and I thought it was very helpful the ways that you suggested really looking at ourselves to try to get ourselves um, first into but then beyond that very seductive story that you're talking exactly, about. Exactly, exactly. You know, what do we say all the time, don't take conflict personally? And you know it's really good it's really good advice, and yet I often joke that it's also utterly useless advice because we can't do it yet, right but we can do it eventually, but we can't do it when we're in the thick of it because it's really personal and and so I say, you know before you take it less personally, you've got to take it more personally, as you said in the introduction, we've got to sort of hug it a little closer and a little lovingly and and figure out what the heck is grabbing me, what is hooking my attention in this. Yeah, that's great. Well, you talked about redirecting, and and in the book, um, obviously, the word you use is pivot. Can you describe what a pivot is? Yes. So um, let me give two examples from outside of the conflict resolution world. So if you think about a basketball game and you see a basketball player rotating you know, in position, they've got one foot on the ground and one foot is moving and they're rotating in position to face another direction in order to pass or shoot the ball more effectively. So you see pivots in sports like that all the time. Uh, In business, you hear a lot about pivoting in business, particularly startups and tech startups. And the idea of a pivot in business is a strategic change in a company's direction, usually motivated by a desire, of course, for greater success. So a pivot in conflict is exactly the same idea. It's this idea of making a purposeful change change in the direction you're focusing away from one thing and toward another. And so the pivots in the book are really away from those three common mistakes and toward something else instead. Very nice. And can you describe a little bit more how they're used in conflict? What what do you suggest people do in order to pivot and to pivot where? Yeah. I so I I'll very briefly introduce the three pivots and um some of the terms I use may not make sense until we get a little longer into the conversation. But um, the first pivot is, is, is goes right to that issue with the stuck story. It's to stop paying attention to the story and grooming it and polishing it lovingly. Uh, and I say lovingly not in a, oh, I love this story sense, but in a, I'm so obsessed with this story sense. Um, because often these stuck <laughs> stories are really painful. You know, we hate them. And partly the reason we're replaying them again and again in our mind is we're trying to figure them out. We're trying to feel better. We're trying to figure out what to do. Um, but there's something so much more important to do, which is to figure out why the stuck story is captivating our attention. And so I say to pivot away from the story itself and toward the message it's trying to tell you. And so that, that, that sort of just quickly introduces the pivot. The second pivot is, uh, goes to the um, mistake I see early uh, that I mentioned earlier about sort of focusing on what they will or won't do. I really want to encourage people to f- not spend their energy completely on what the other person will or won't do, but instead turn to your own behavior and what has hooked you. In other words, it's paying attention to what are the underlying reasons for your stuck story. It's mining that stuck story for its really important message. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about conflict hooks, so I won't say a whole lot about it now, but when we can figure out what our conflict hooks are, not only for a specific conflict, but in conflict in general, we have a huge um, opportunity to kind of navigate our lives differently, which it was a good learning lesson for me in my own life. And the third is to turn away from the past well, and, and toward the now. Yeah, and, and those three, I mean, to me, those are so helpful, <clears throat> first of all, to really understand the message that, that um, to me, about what the conflict is. But then that second part, Tammy, I just, I just really appreciate, which is not to try to make the other person change, because we, we know over and over and over again in our lives that we can't change anybody else, and yet 
we continue to hope, we continue to try, <laughs> and it it just perpetuates the problem. It does perpetuate the problem. No, you know, I can't remember who said this, but somebody made the great observation that I read once. It said, "No one changes without first being understood." And um, oh, nice. So, and we have this That's effort powerful. always to try to get everyone around us, our loved ones. I'm guilty, you know. Every now and then, my husband will turn to me and he'll say, "Time to pivot." <laughs> you know, you're you're trying to change uh, things, you know, and I'll think, "Oh, you are so smart." How can you be so self-actual? <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. No. Well, let me just remind everyone that we are you are listening to the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio Program, and we are talking with Dr. Tammy Lenski about the conflict pivot, turning conflict into peace of mind. You mentioned earlier, Tammy, about the conflict hook. Can you tell us a little bit more about the conflict hook? Yeah. You know, we often use the term in conflict that someone presses our buttons, right? Um, mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, that person he knows exactly what buttons to press. And the concept is un, is is a good one in some ways because it makes a point about there's something in us that someone can press that button and something not so good will happen. What I don't like about the concept is that it implies that someone else is doing it to us when it's accurate. It's far more accurate to understand that we kind of don't we kind of press our own buttons. They may do something, but what we do with what they said or did is what causes our buttons to be pressed. And I'm really a a much bigger fan of the idea of a hook. Something snags us in a conflict, Mm -hmm. or it might not even be a conflict yet. It might just be a casual conversation with a guy at the mobile station. Uh, But something snags our attention and doesn't feel so great. And I I, I often compare it to the idea of if you're trying to crawl under a barbed wire fence and you've got a beautiful sweater on and the barb snags you, you could just keep pulling, you know, you could just try to rip your way through, but you're going to ruin your sweater and you're going to leave some damage in, in your wake. Better to sort of stop and back up a little and get a little closer to that barb in order to release yourself. And that's the idea of uh, our conflict hooks. If we get a little closer to them and understand them better, we have a chance to release ourselves from them. And the idea of a conflict hook comes from uh, the work of a uh, of a woman named uh, Dr. Stella Ting Tumi, who's done a lot of work on intercultural communication and conflict. And she has done a great deal of really well done research on what she calls the six domains um, around face, saving face, and, how, and the sort of underlying parts of her identity. And I took those six domains and modified them ever so slightly based on my experience. And there are six of them, and I'm going to run through them if this is okay with you guys, just very quickly so people know Please. kind of what we're talking about. Absolutely. So the idea is that all we all have some form of this hook of each of these six in us, but that one or two, sometimes more, tend to be our really big ones, the ones that are more likely to snag us uh, than others. So here they are. The first and, and a very common one for American audiences is, is the competence hook. And competence is our need to be recognized as things like capable and intelligent, skilled, having expertise. Competence hooks really come up a lot in workplace conflict, but not only in workplace conflict, at home as well, but it it, it echoes big in in the workplace. The second is autonomy, and that's our need to be acknowledged as independent and self-reliant and having clear boundaries. The third is fellowship, sometimes called an inclusion hook. It's our need to be included and viewed as likable, cooperative, worthy people. The fourth is status. No one ever likes to think they have a status hook, uh, but it, in the workplace this comes up a lot. Uh, it's our need to be admired for both tangible and intangible assets, and those might be things like attractiveness and reputation and power and material worth. And the reason it comes up a lot in the workplace is uh, I'll hear a manager say something like, she doesn't respect my authority in this organization, and that's classic status kind of language. Um, the the fifth is reliability, our need to be seen as trustworthy, dependable, and loyal. And the last is integrity, and that's our need to be understood and seen and respected for our dignity, our, sorry, our dignity, our honor, our virtue, and our good character. So I said earlier that we all have all of these. Any one of these could be hooked in a conflict, but certain ones really come up more than others. For example, in my life, competence is the biggie. It's the one that's going to snag me more than others. My husband... He, you know, people could tell him he's an idiot, and he just it would not phase him. But he's got a very different conflict. So <laughs> try to get him to do something that he doesn't want to do, and the first thing he feels is 
his autonomy being threatened, his his independence, you know, someone trying someone trying to manipulate or control him, even if that's not the intention. That's the experience he has, and that's why conflict can happen. People don't have to intend to do it, but it's what we perceive as being threatened or insulted in some way in those parts of our identity. Thank you. It seems like the conflict hooks are really individualized, and it really speaks to the personality of the person that's dealing with that that snag, that thing that really grabs them. They really are. That's why, you know, people sometimes will say to me, why does that bother you? That shouldn't bother you. And I, and I think when I hear that, I think, aha, yeah, we'll just wait till their conflict hook gets snagged, and then I'll say to them, you shouldn't let that bother you. That doesn't bother me. <laughs> So, yes, they're very individual, and one of the great things is we can figure out, it's not a terribly difficult exercise, to figure out what our biggest hooks are and then uh, figure out how to manage them. And in the book, of course, I talk about how to do that. That's a great segue, actually, Tammy, because what we like to do is leave the listeners with an assignment for the week or a call to action. Uh, Is there anything specific that you would like to leave the listeners with so they can continue learning about um, the conflict pivot? Yeah, I'd that. love to. There, um, There's a great exercise that uh, people can actually get from my website. I'll tell them how in a minute. Um, that is an, uh, it's a worksheet for figuring out your own conflict hooks. It walks people through a process. And it's a three-part process, but if people walk through the first and second parts, if really all they want to understand is their particular big conflict hooks, the first and second steps will get them there. And it just walks them through a sequence of steps to think about it. It's a free worksheet. People can uh, give me their email address, and I'll give them the access to it. They can either go to my regular website or they can go to the the website that's uh, based on the book title, which is just conflictpivot.com, and they'll see a a little uh, link to get the free worksheet, and they can get it that way. And, of course, I should say, since we're talking about this book, that um, if people finish the worksheet and they think, I don't know, I'm, um, I'm not sure yet, if they want to take a deeper dive or they really want to get more help doing it, that's in part what the book is designed to do. Great. Great. Thank you. No, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, you could, um, if you could say just a little bit more about those conflict hooks or give a little bit more in-depth example of how you work with the conflict hooks. Yeah, you know, I find that when I'm working with somebody and uh is that once people really understand their hooks, certain things happen sort of almost automatically. One thing that happens is that some conflicts cease to exist at all. They never happen. And uh, do we have time for me to tell you like a 1-minute story about that? You at, well, yeah, we do actually have okay. time. Yes. Great. I I tell this story in the book so I know you've probably both heard it. Um Years ago, I won't give all the backdrop, but I was at a mobile station and I couldn't get the little key pass on my um, key on my key ring to work. To you know, you wave it at the pump and the and it takes the, uh, the right. charge for the gasoline right out of your checking account. And I had, didn't have my wallet with me. I only had the darn key ring, and I couldn't get the thing to work. And I mean, it's a really simple little thing. You take a piece of plastic and you wave it in front of, front of a certain part on the pump. So I go uh-huh. inside and I say to the guy, "I can't get." the key pass to work um, on pump number two. Can you help me? And he says, total deadpan, it was working a few minutes ago. <laughs> and, you know, uh-huh. I have a confidence trigger, right? I have a confidence uh-huh. hook. So, you know, if, if he had said that to my husband, it would not have registered at all. But for me, the Richter scales start to go, you know, to Ooh. really hit 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.7 instantaneously because that's my thing. And so the, what I hear in that message is, you idiot, you can't wave a piece of plastic properly at a pump. That's what I hear and what he is. not what he said, funny. but it's what I hear. And, um, of course, because I was working on this book and I was teaching this stuff, it was really fresh on my mind. And, you know, I I joke often that I'm from, I live in New Hampshire, but I'm from New York originally, and I'm very capable of sort of dissecting someone verbally very quickly. That's kind of the culture that I was brought up in. I could easily have taken him down and just said something really sarcastic about his, you know, handiness with customer service. But instead, what I said to him is, what do you mean? And he said, that pump has been a problem all week. We're going to go out now. It's going to be working just fine. I've told the boss. He doesn't believe it. And and as I listened to him go on and on and on, I realized his response had absolutely nothing to do with me at all. It was all about his own challenges. 
but because I had a competence trigger, I almost got us into a conflict. And so that's what I mean by saying when we know our our hooks, uh, then certain conflicts just never happen. So that's one pretty amazing thing. The other thing is that people, when they learn what their hooks are and they learn some of the strategies in the book for managing them, uh, they there's a little exercise we actually can do when we're stuck in a conflict with somebody. We can go close the door, sit down with a piece of paper or, or our computer screen, and just run through a series of really quick questions. And I've gotten to the point doing this in my own life or with clients that we can walk through it in, in pretty fast order, five minutes, two minutes, and begin to nail very quickly what are the things that if we are going to figure this out together, what are the things we really do need to talk about? What are the things that are central here? So that we're not spending a lot of our time uh, talking about the things that are not really central to what's going on in this conflict. What kind of, what kind of questions are you thinking of that, that you would go through? So the first thing, I'll, it, it's, it's pretty much the sequence that people will experience in the worksheet, only it's just shorter form once people understand the the concept, but I'll say to a client, so tell me what it was in what happened that stands out most for you. Tell me why it stood out, what bothered you, what was the message you heard from them. We've already, you know, if I've, if I've been working with this client a little bit, they already know their hooks, and I'll say which hooks got snagged. And, you know, they'll mm-hmm. usually be able to pretty quickly, sometimes they have to think about it some more, but uh, pretty quickly, um, it's often the same hooks again and again for most of us, and we'll say, okay, so let's think, think that through. Did they intend to? Were they trying to do it? If they weren't, then a certain part of this goes away right away. But if they really feel like, well, you know, they may not have been deliberately trying to, but they really did damage my reputation or they really did insult mm-hmm. my, my, my status as their boss, uh, then we'll think through. So what you know? What do you need to talk about with that? If they, if you, them respecting you is important because of who you are in this organization, how, what do you need to talk about that to make sure that uh, they understand that and that the two of you both understand what disrespect actually looks and feels like? Because you may be having very different experiences of that. You know, right. Nina, probably from your years' experience, when people say words like respect or he interrupts <laughs> me. You know, they can mean a million yeah. different things to different people. Right. So the, okay. so then so what we're doing in that conversation is figuring out what makes it what makes sense to talk about and what is the stuff that's not. And there's some things that someone may say something like well she really I'll give you an example. I had a couple of clients a while back who uh, were business owners together, and they just kept snagging each other again and again and again. And one of them was always felt like she was being left out of all the big decisions in the company again and again and again. And the other one kept saying, I just don't understand why she thinks that. And in talking about it with the, the first woman, um, she said, you know, my whole life I've been left out. I was the middle child. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, everyone got more attention than me. Uh, in my whole life, all my work, all and, and, and I'm th- realizing as we're talking that this sense of um, fellowship had been challenged in her her whole life, and it was following mm-hmm. her around doggedly, right? And so she's so sensitive to that that any decision that the other one made that wasn't fully vetted with her, she saw through the lens of I'm being left out again. And so, uh, you know, with her, we spent a lot of time thinking about how she was going to manage her own fellowship hook uh, so that the other person wasn't walking on eggshells wondering all the time and then working with the other person to make sure that she paid double duty attention to not leaving the other one out around the most important decisions and how that was going to happen. So then we could really talk not in general terms of I'm leaving you out, no, I'm, you're leaving me out, no, I'm not, yes, you are, no, I'm not, none of those kinds of conversations, but instead what are the actual pragmatic actions they could each take that would address that. Mm-hmm. So, Tammy, I have a question. That I, as I was reading the book, uh, one of the things that struck me, and I have to admit this is also true in my own life, um, is how often – once you figure out what's hooking you, you realize you don't have to deal with the conflict at all. Would you say that that's the most typical thing that happens? I think it's very typical, yes. I mean, when I started figuring this stuff out for my own life, and, you know, over 10 years ago I started thinking about this stuff and working with it actively, it was stunning to me how many things I could just shrug and walk away from because they were non-entities. They didn't matter. 
Um, and yeah. I, you know, and it is an incredible, and I'm not like a big conflict bag that, you know, I'm like, I'm not looking at, for a left and right, but, um, but we see things and get snagged by things uh, because of our conflict hooks, because of these parts of our identity that we hold dear. And boy, isn't it freeing in life to not um, carry them all around with us. I joke that I used to be four foot three and now I'm five foot ten. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's really great. And and yet there are things that we do have to deal with. And so, you know, I, I like the fact that, that with the pivot, you, what you're trying to do is to really figure out, okay, this one I really do have to deal with. So Exactly. Well, we, exactly. We are we are coming to the end of the program and I'm wondering um what final message you would be willing to leave with our listeners. You know, I think that there is so much that we can each do by ourselves to end a conflict and to change what happens to us when we're in a conflict. And so what I want people to do is not wait and be frustrated and wait for the other person to step forward, but to take your power back and do some of this uh, work on your own and uh, change your life in the process. Well, that's beautiful. Well, um, there are a couple of web pages that everyone can go to, uh, www.lensky.com and then www.conflictpivots.com. And then uh, Tammy's email is Tammy at Lensky.com. And these are all also on the Conflict Coach uh, blog radio website. Um, so thank you so much, Tammy. This is, this is really wonderful. Zena and Tracy, thank you so much for having me. Um, it was such a treat to be able to talk about this stuff that I care about so deeply. It was great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.